Morning, church. How are we doing today? Gauging a little temperature of the room here. How's this side? Good. How are we doing over here? This side is much happier than you. I don't know what the, I don't know what the deal is. You know, I, I walked out this morning and realized that I need new shoes. These shoes have some miles on them, and they're very smooth on the bottom, as you can probably see. Uh, I took one step outside, and I almost went down on my backside, and my first thought was, we are going to be really light on worship attendance uh, this morning. But then I showed up this morning and I thought of a Marines commercial. The few, the proud, the United Methodists. Man, you, you guys came out this morning. And I'm, so, uh, I'm so excited uh, about that. So welcome uh, to worship this morning. If I haven't introduced myself to you, my name is Matt German. I'm the new associate pastor here. And uh, man, I just, I don't know. I, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but I'm having a pretty good time with you all uh, on Sunday mornings. I feel like God's presence is breaking through in our worship experiences, and uh, myself and others who, who talk to me are testifying that uh, they're seeing the gospel with fresh eyes. Um, and you know what? As a pastor and as just a co-collaborator uh, in the gospel alongside you all, that, that's, really, uh, that's really exciting to me. And I'm praying and I'm hoping for more of that uh, this morning. If you're just joining us or if you're visiting with us uh, today, I just want to take a second and kind of catch you up a little bit with what we've been up to. This is, we are in the season of Advent. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit different here at First United Methodist uh, Church this year. So oftentimes during Advent, we look back. Uh, way back into the, the Old Testament, and we look back at, at prophecies, and, and, and Pastor Steve is doing a series like that in, in traditional services. Uh, if you're into double headers on Sunday morning, you can catch that at 11 o'clock. I'll be there. I encourage you to, to check that out uh, as well. But we're, do, we're, we're taking Advent a little bit different uh, here at Transformation this year. Not only are we looking at Advent through the lens of the New Testament, but we're rather than going back to the beginning, we're starting with the end. If you were here uh, last week, you know that we are kicking off uh, an Advent series called Not a Silent Night. We love to take Christmas and we love to, to sanitize it and make it about the, you know, this, this, this birth of this, this cute little, little cherub that comes into, comes into the world. But the reality of Christmas is that Jesus Christ entered the world through uh, laying in a feeding trough. <laughs> You realize that? And left it hanging on a cross. He first spent the first two years of his life as a refugee in Africa and spent the next several years of his uh, life growing up being groomed for this big task that God had called him to, to be the savior of the world. And if you've read the Bible or if you're even anything familiar at all with the story of Christianity, you know how this story ends. But it's not the end, is it? The cross is, is not the end. That's why we are a people of, of the resurrection. That's why at Christmas we can claim hope. And I've realized that, you know, so oftentimes we say we love the, you know, we say Merry Christmas and we say, or Happy Holidays, which I also have no problem with. The root word of holiday is holy day, just for, for the record. So say that too if, if you want to. But there's also many of us in our midst that Christmas is also a difficult season. Maybe it's the first Christmas that you're spending without the presence of one of your loved ones. Maybe it's a season in which you have recently uh, received a, a diagnosis that you weren't uh, expecting. And I want to lift up that whether you're saying happy holidays or whether that's difficult for you to say this time of year, Christmas is a season of hope. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, who will save and redeem the world. That is you, my friends. So last week we looked at the, the last few years of the life of Mary. We're, we're looking at Advent through the eyes of Mary. And we said it's difficult to do because, quite frankly, we don't have a lot of uh, biblical record of the last few years of Mary's life. So we tried to imagine, based upon the evidence that we did have, what would Mary be doing after the resurrection, after the ascension. And we said, more than likely, based upon the scriptures that we had, the very last written scripture that we have of Mary was after Jesus has ascended and she, the, her and the disciples are gathered in prayer. And they were preparing for the mission to go and make disciples. 
We saw what the early church looked like in Acts chapter 2, where they were breaking bread together, where they gathered in the temple courts and in each other's homes, where they laid their possessions at the feet of the apostles, where there were no needy persons amongst them. And we said, man, doesn't that sound like a movement I want to be part of? Doesn't that sound like a movement you want to be a part of? And that was the description of the early church. And we challenged our thinking that this is the activity that Mary would have been engaged in, serving the least and the lost. And we talked about how so often our Christmas becomes about what we can acquire rather than remembering that Christmas is not your birthday. (laughs) It's Jesus's birthday. And Jesus said, ultimately, we will be judged by what we do unto the least of these. And when you do unto the least of these, you're doing unto us. So what better gift can we get Jesus for his birthday than to serve the least and the lost? No doubt, Mary would have been engaged in the mission. And I invited you last week to engage in a different kind of Christmas this year. And today we come, as we're tracking back from from Mary's end of life, all the way culminating Christmas Eve up to the story of the cross, or the story of the birth. This morning, we come to Calvary. We come to Calvary. And what we know is that when Jesus was was hanging there on a cross, there were seven things that Jesus said as he was being crucified. There could have been more than seven, but we have seven of those statements recorded in the Gospels. He looks into the eyes of who had just nailed him to the tree, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He said, (laughs) he said to a thief at his side, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. He looks into the eyes of his mother. He looks into the eyes, the scriptures say, the disciple whom he loved, which was John, And he says, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. As he entrusts his mother's care into the disciple whom he loved. And today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one of the things that Jesus said that is one of the most confusing things that he said in his entire public ministry. It's one of the most controversial And confusing things to us that we read in the Bible when he cries out in Aramaic where he says, Aloy, Aloy, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I want to acknowledge that when you're hanging on the cross, you know, we think so often that uh, crucifixion, that the cause of death is, is trauma, right? Not the case. Not the case. When you're hanging on the cross, you physically have to lift your own body to expand your diaphragm to breathe. So at the end of his life, when he would cry this out, Jesus is getting very tired. He's getting very weak at this point. His lungs are beginning to fill with fluid. And he cries out these words. And what I want to assure you, that even in death, Jesus speaks life. Someone say life. Life. Jesus speaks life. And that's where we're going today. And you may say, what the heck does that have to do with Advent? Special delivery? Well, that's a downer. Special delivery. Hmm. And I would challenge our thinking. As Mary is standing at the foot of Calvary, looking her son in the eye, what would be running through her mind at this point? We have several mothers in here. We have several fathers in here. We have several grandparents in here. If you've never had children of your own, certainly you have those in your life whom you look upon with compassion. What would have Mary have been thinking in the six hours that Jesus was on the cross? And my challenge this morning is that I have to believe that she was thinking about Christmas. That she was more than likely thinking about Christmas. Likely, she was thinking about Christmas because Christmas is the only thing that makes sense in light of the cross. It's the only thing that makes sense in the light of the cross. She would have thought about the shepherds when they visited her in the stable. In Luke chapter 2 in verse 11, when they say this, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. 
He is the Messiah, the Lord. All these things that are happening on the cross are beginning to, to, to make sense to Mary. Wait, I mean, when you see someone you love is, and, and that's suffering, our first reaction is, why? Why is this happening? And she would have been thinking about this explanation. A Savior is born to you, the Messiah, the Lord. She would have remembered the eighth day after Jesus was born when they took Jesus to the temple. In Jewish tradition, you would have your son dedicated to the Lord on the eighth day. It was the scripture that we read this morning. And it was so, oh, it was so funny to me this morning. Lisa, you don't make every sermon, but you seem to make almost all of them the last four weeks. But Lisa came up to me this week. She's like, what the heck is this? What is this? I, you're going to explain this, right? I mean, this has very, I don't, this has nothing to do with Christmas. And the reality is that Simeon, a prophet, was told that he would see the Messiah before his own death. And upon seeing the Messiah, it says this, Luke chapter 2, verses 3, 4 through 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And what does he say? And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary's going to have to give something of herself in this process as well. She would, at the foot of the cross, she would have been thinking of Simeon's words, a sword will pierce your own soul too. What would that mean at birth of her son? Only in light of cross would this start, start to be making sense. She would have been thinking of the magi who showed up with gifts of gold, frankincense, and my favorite, myrrh. I just like to say that. Myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, a gift that is given unto royalty. Frankincense, an herb that's oftentimes used in embalming. Special delivery, here's your embalming fluid. And myrrh, a medicinal herb that's used to dull pain. Gold frankincense. I mean, can't you just imagine standing at the foot of the cross that these things that seem so confusing 33 years earlier are starting to, in some way, some shape, start to make sense. It's starting to make sense. What I want to lift up this morning is that Christmas and Calvary they go hand in hand. Christmas and the cross are completely inseparable. Christmas, my friends, is a celebration of a baby who would save us, who would save the world. And ultimately, in our efforts to sanitize Christmas, ultimately this baby was born to die on your behalf. And this is the greatest gift that God could have given us. He gave, God gave us God's own very self so that you would be reconciled and brought into right relationship with one another and with him. This is the gift of Christmas. The cross and Christmas are completely inseparable. So we get to this, these words that Jesus cries on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken. This is so confusing to us when we read this. In light of our Trinitarian theology, you know, we believe that God is what? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That, they're, they're, that, they, that they are one, and yet Jesus feels this separation I mean, we have the promises throughout Scripture. You, if you open the Bible, you will never find the word Trinity in the Bible. It doesn't exist in the Bible. But God's Trinitarian fingerprints are all over the salvific story from Genesis to Revelation of God revealing God's self in these three persons. And the best scholars in the world can't fully articulate what the Trinity is, any more than they can fully articulate why Jesus would say something as radical. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, in our intellect, we know that the presence of God is never apart from us, is it? 
It's never apart from us. But in the book of 1 John, it says, when our hearts betray us, God is still faithful. Oftentimes, our intellect, we know when we're going through hard times, when we're, we're suffering, that, I mean, it's a promise to God. I will never leave you, abandon, or forsake you. And yet, in the midst of hardship, what does our heart say? Why, oh God? Where are you, oh God? When I was in seminary, I had a, a, a friend. His name is, is Gordon. He was in my graduating class. And we were in our middle year of school, and I was walking into my, one of my doctrine classes, and I get a call from Gordon. And Gordon is obnoxiously bubbly. I mean, he's just one of those personalities that you have to take in doses because it's, like, it's one of those things where you go, up and you go why are you so happy all the time, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a great quality to have, right? But that wasn't the tone when Gordon called me. Gordon says, I'm not going to make it to class today. Lisa has died. I said, what? Lisa, his wife of five years, Gordon is my age. He had gone home from lunch today to find that his wife had had an epileptic seizure and had passed away in their bed. And I went to visit him when he got back from the morgue that afternoon. And he said, why, Matt? Why is, this, why is this happening to me? I've been a good boy my whole life. I mean, I, 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 I moved my wife, I moved my family across the nation to come to this place, to University of Dubuque Seminary. I'm, 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 I'm following God's call. I'm going into the ministry for crying out loud. Why? Why has God forsaken me? And in that moment, we opened up to this passage. Aloy, aloy, lama sabachthani. And we devoted on a savior of the world who is very godly and who is also very human. A God that understands suffering. A God that understands pain. And the truth is, when our hearts break, it breaks the very heart of God. And I think we all pray that prayer at some point in our lives. Don't we? My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? Maybe it's when, for you, it was when a, a loved one passed away that you weren't anticipating. Maybe it's when you're facing a battle that you never asked for. Maybe it's when you've received a recent diagnosis that you never anticipated. When God feels conspicuously small and absent in our lives. And what I want to encourage you with this morning is that not only do you serve a very divine God who's on the throne, who's in control, you serve a very human God that knows hardship, that knows what it means to suffer, that knows pain, that doesn't understand that just in the divine Trinitarian head, but understands where you're at <laughs> in the midst of where you are in the moment. That's the kind of God that we worship, my friends. And that gives me encouragement. Because oftentimes our reaction when, when hardship in life hits, when life doesn't go away, we oftentimes we, we, we rebel from God. We cease to pray rather than praying without ceasing. We lose trust, forgetting that this God has promised to be with us, to never leave us, abandon us, forsake us, has promised to direct our paths. And what we see on the cross is that even in those moments of hardship where it appears that Jesus is questioning his Father, him directing those feelings towards the Father is still an act of Jesus turning to God. Do you understand that? That even in the worst of moments, Jesus directs his life towards the Father. This goes to show that God can handle your tough questions. God can handle your anger, even at times when it may be directed at him. 
Have you ever felt that way? In your own life, in your own heart of hearts, have you ever felt a abandoned by God? Have you ever felt for, forsaken? That God doesn't hear you? That God doesn't understand where you're at or what you're going through? We're going to flip this whole thing upside down today. We're just going to flip it upside down because that's exactly what Jesus did when he cried, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani. I told you, even in death, Jesus speaks life. Say life. Life. Jesus is speaking life. Jesus, when he cries these words out, is quoting scripture. It's the opening line to Psalm 22. Psalm actually means song. It's an act of worship that Jesus is engaging in when he opens that. And let's just try something. You say the next phrase after me. Amazing grace. Boom. You know that, don't you? And it would have been the same way on Calvary when Jesus would have cried out that famous song, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The crowds would have popped tall. It would have caught their attention and they would have known exactly what was coming. Bring up Psalm 22, verse one through two. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And it goes on. It goes on. Move to the next one. At the end, read this. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. (laughs) He has done it. It ends with the promise of the resurrection, my friends. It ends with a promise of hope. Even in death, Jesus speaks life. And he declares from the cross that the worst thing is never the last thing. That death does not have the final say. And Jesus said so with his own life, death, and resurrection. It's not only a plea of agony of his humanness in the moment, but it's a cry of victory in the end. Hallelujah! Right? I mean, hallelujah! The season of Advent, a season of hope. And I think this is such a good word for us today because every one of us, I think, comes to a crossroads in our own faith when we say, my God, my God. What the hell? I mean, seriously. In our humanness, we, we, we cry out. A point where we begin to ask the, the tough questions. We begin to say, is this, I'm not so sure that this God is even, not only with us, I'm not even sure that this God is for us. Is God with us? Is God for us? And Jesus assures us from Calvary with an unapologetic yes. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. That the worst thing is never the last thing. And that death does not have the final word. And Jesus said so from the cross. Bring up that litany of Psalm 22 for me. I want to invite you to respond to the, to the bolded text. This is from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? So far from the words of my groaning? In you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. You know, friends, I'm getting to know many of you better and better. I don't know all of you as well as I'd like to yet. 
I don't know all of your stories. I don't know what all you're going through right now, whether it's a happy holiday or whether that's a struggle for you to say right now. But, and I don't mean to spoil the ending. I don't mean to spoil the ending of your own story. But here's the good news that we discover from the words of Jesus from the cross, that when it's all said and done, hear me, friends, when it's all said and done, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God has got you. God has not left you. God has not abandoned you. In fact, he has bled and died on your behalf just to prove how faithful he truly is. Unto you in the city of David, a Savior is born. A Savior that will never leave you, that will never abandon you, that will never forsake you. And in this Advent season, we claim hope because even in death, Jesus speaks life. And he speaks that promise over each and every single one of you. This morning, as you exit worship, you're going to be invited to take a stone with you. And remember the words of Simeon, that in the end, a sword will pierce your own soul too, Simeon says to Mary. You know, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ has never promised us a life without hardship. It has never promised us a life of suffering. In fact, when you read the Bible, it's a story of a disobedient people who oftentimes suffer and God's presence, nearness, and reconciliation that appears over and over and over and over again. That's the story of the scriptures, and that's our story. Jesus says, you, you... you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world, he says. As you leave today, I invite you to take this stone with you and to remember that not only at times in our own lives are our own souls pierced, but Mary's soul was pierced, and evidently Jesus was pierced as he hung on the cross. But as you cradle that stone in your hand today, I want you to remember that the worst thing is not the last thing. And that death never has the final say. And in the end, my friends, it's going to be okay. Jesus speaks life over your life. Trust in the promises of God. And in this Advent season, Claim hope. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen.